Hi, everybody, and thanks for coming here. Uh, so we'll talk today about a project called Squash. It's an open source project, and we kind of like try to understand what is the motivation of creating it, what gap is kind of like covering the ecosystem, and how it's going to integrate with everything that we're doing today. So quick word about myself. So my name is Edith Levine, and I'm uh, uh, the founder of a company called Solio. It's a startup company. Um, uh, this specifically project was done by me and by uh, my employee, Koyuval Kohai, who is a brilliant uh, engineer. Uh, and, uh, and we, before that, did a lot of open source projects. We founded Project Unique, and now Squash, and we, inter we basically contributed to tons of others. Um, OK, so what is the problem that we try to solve? So you all know about it, and I will go very fast, because I know that you guys know all of this. But basically, debug microservice, microservice application, it's an odd problem to do. And it's really, really simple. Why? Because way on the back, back on the day, we had one analytic application. If you wanted to actually debug it and understand the states of the application, you needed to just attach a debugger. And basically, you got a picture, an image of all what happening in the memory. Right? You basically saw the state of the application. You can see the even stuck. You can actually see everything that's happening. And the story, understand what this application is doing. But that's not the case right now, because we really, really wanted to be uh, more uh, scalable. We needed to actually take this monolithic application and cut it to a very little small pieces. So now it's a little bit of a problem, because now all these little pieces are actually has their own kind of like image of memory. But the question is how we kind of like understand what's happening in all the, the application itself. And you know, here it's an example with a few containers, but actually the real application that we're running today in production will look more like this, right? The Netflix of the world and Twitter running like over 500 containers. So it's kind of like very complicated to tell a story, to understand the story. Uh, this is a tweet that was tweeted back then, but I really like it. So I just saw that it will be amusing. But basically, someone just moved his uh, monolithic application to microservices, and now every time that he has an outage, it's basically a murder mystery. As any can see, there is a lot of people who simplify with this problem because it was tweeted a lot and we liked a lot. Uh, okay, so now I'm not going to talk about open tracing because you, le you, you learned so much about it on the last two days. But I will mention it, and mainly what I will focus is what it really is and what it's not. And this is where I'm going to put the focus, what it's not going to do for you and where I see the gap. So real quick, again, you know that I'm going to go very, very quick. Basically, the idea is that it's a transaction like logging. You're taking the ID. You send it to all the pieces of your app or transaction application. You're getting a peak, you know, you, you can actually get a picture of something like that, right? So now you have tracing and span. You basically understand the application look, who is calling who, and what they're doing. Okay, so that's basically what open tracing is. I'm not going to talk about that again. This is for people who doesn't know this stuff, but we talk so much about open tracing in this conference that I felt that you probably most of you understand what it's doing, uh, and it's in the foundation. I'm not going to show you a demo because you probably see, but I will focus on this and what it really is, what it's trying to solve, what is its purpose, and not what we're abusing to be, because we're kind of like abusing what it really is. So what it is, it's a logging, right? This is what it is. It's basically you logging your application. And logging is basically mean printing. That's what we're doing, right? Um, it's a really good one, but what it's doing, it's logging. What you're not logged, you don't know, right? Um, you can kind of like stress it, and people in Uber, for instance, uh, Yuri is doing it, that basically you're taking the, those login that you collect and kind of like feed them as a metrics to different tools, metrics tool, but again, this is not what it's for, right? It's basically, it's login. Now, you are getting a, con a, a it's, con in co it's conceptual uh, login, which means that you actually know the context of the login, so you can actually see it much better and see how it view and understand who is called who and so on. But again, I'll continue saying that it's login. Now, you can understand the critical path and I'll ask this a little bit. If you see what's going on, who is calling who, you kind of like get a picture of where could you have a problem with latency. And then you can analyze it, right? So because you do see the topology, right? Uh, but here's what it's not, and here's what, for my opinion, is weakness of the solution. So open tracing is not a runtime debugger. Basically, you sending all the information somewhere, it's aggregating the log, it's massaging it, and you will see it 10 minutes after, right? So basically, it's not a runtime debugger, and this is really, really important that people will understand. You will need to take 10 minutes to actually do, get the logs. 
you need to wrap and change the code. I mean, if your application, in the end of the day, you need to log, right? So you need to put this login on the, to on the token. You need to wrap it in a library that will be able to kind of like know who to send the log to. And this is something that you need to do. And it's better right now with the integration of service mesh, but you still need to do it and you still have some code that you need to add to your application. Um, and you're not really getting an holistic view here because what you're getting, it's only what you're printing. If you didn't print the value, you're not going to see it there, right? So if the pro you have a problem that you didn't think about or you don't know what is the problem method that's doing your problem, you will not see there. And what you will need to do is actually go to your application, print it again, send it to your, to your, to your, uh, to production, to, to the system again, push it again, and then you will need again to basically uh, um, uh, wait 10 minutes until you're getting the logs. Um, the, the, the next thing is that, as I said, it's basically you can change variable in, in runtime because it's not a runtime debugger. So basically you can only see that after 10 minutes. And you know, there is a very good presentation that you saw this week about open tracing for Ben and, a, and a, from Lightstep and from people like Yuri. But in the end of the day, this application purpose is to show you what it's capable of doing, but it does not make sense to log all of this, right? Because it's giving you a huge performance issue, right? I mean, basically, these things is on your network, and, and then you need to find the, the balance, and you can't send it all the time, so you need to sample it, and you need to decide what is the sampling rate, and it's a very, very, delicate trade-off that you need to make, and it's not easy to everybody to make it. You need to be expert like Yuri or like Ben. So, so this is the limitation that I see, and this is what, what I felt that there is a gap, and this is where squash can basically help. So we, you know, when I was a system engineer, um, all we did is basically, I, I dealt a lot with the operating system and Unikernel, and I was doing a lot of Go application. My best friend was the debugger. Basically, we, we took a Unikernel of RAMP1, we put it on Raspberry Pi. Guess what? Black screen. You can't even debug it. So GDB was our best friend, right? So we used a lot of the debugger. And then when I was in my previous company, and I was working with one of my new engineers, who were basically born in the cloud, and we worked on some application and said to him, okay, let's just attach the debugger, see what's going on. And he said, attach the debugger? So basically, I feel that this is a tool set that kind of like disappeared for the new generation uh, cloud. And I felt that this is something that we can help. And the reason it's, it's for not, for the, not used right now because it's complicated, right? You need to pipe a lot of stuff. So we decided to do the piping for you. That's basically what we did. So what is Squash? Squash is basically orchestration for debugger. So what it's doing, it's basically seamlessly integrate with your infrastructure. And when I'm saying infrastructure, I actually mean platforms. And for instance, Kubernetes. Seamlessly, which means that it's not changing the platform. And this really, really key stuff that we, you know, we really, really insist of not changing the code. And basically, that way it can use with the OpenShift or any other distro that exists in the market because we are not changing the, the, the Kubernetes um, code itself. And on the other side, we're basically piping it all the way to the IDE because in the end of the day, this is what we're doing. We're writing code in the IDE and we want to debug it. That's how we, we, we did that. So what you're getting with Squash, because it's basically leveraging the regular debugger. We are not writing our own debugger. We're leveraging all the debugger that exists there. So what we're getting from it is live debugging across multi-microservices, multi right? You basically can jump between microservices and I will show a demo soon. Uh, it's, you can debug container, you can debug pod, you can, uh, you can debug a service, you can set a breakpoint, you can step into a, 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 your code, and the last thing, and very important, is you can actually modify a variable on runtime and see how it will affect your application. So let's see demo real quick, that way I think you will understand what I'm talking about. So, going to one sec. Environment, don't worry about it, it's just setting up my environment. I try it on AWS, so hopefully the network will not kill me. Okay. So this is a microservices application that I wrote, really, really simple one. Basically what it's doing is getting two parameter and print the result, right? And you can add, add or subscribe. So I just put whatever value we want here, it doesn't really matter. And we will calculate and we see that it's not really working, right? 55 plus 33 is not 22. So we have a bug here, right? So what we can do. So if I'm using open tracing or any other logging tool, I will need to log, I will need to change that in my application, push it again to the, my Kubernetes environment, and I need to wait until it's actually log and so on. But maybe I don't have to do that. Maybe all I need to do is basically go to this application in the IDE. 
and say that this application is actually built from two microservices. I don't know if you can see it, but it's not really interesting. It's a Go application. The first services is basically a UI, right? It's basically generate the UI, and it's getting the value that it's getting, and it's sending it to the second domain core services, again, written in Go, and basically, it's either add or subtract. Really, really simple application. Uh, so what I will do next, I'm basically going to uh, use the command pilot. I don't know if you're familiar with Visual Studio Code, but the thing that I like the most is that everything you can reach from the command pilot. So we wrote a squash extension. And that's giving you more functionality. So extension in Visual Studio, you can just it really easily from the marketplace install, and you have all this uh, capability. So what we're going to do now, we're basically going to run debug container, because that's what we want to do. What happened is that the ID went and basically talked to my group, uh, group, uh, group, through group CTL, and basically brought me all the pod that's running that I can see, right? So it's kind of like secure, only what I can see. Um, and because it's service one, I will choose the one that it's service one. Now it will tell you, present me the container in this pod. I will choose the one that I have. And it asks me, which debugger do you want me to attach? And I will say DLV because it's Go. And you will say <coughs> that in a second, it's basically attached, right? So now let's do exactly the same thing for the other services. So debug container. Now we'll choose the pod two, service two. We will attach to the container, and we will choose again DLV because it's a Go application. So in a second, that one will be attached again. So now I'm basically attached and waiting, so what I should do is just go and calculate it again. What will happen is it will jump because it's actually a debugger. And now I can step into, I see all the memory, I can see all my variable and where I am, and now it looks, and I can use all the regular command, and basically I can run, and then it will jump to the other one, because I put a breakpoint there as well, right? And now it will go true, right? And you will, you will see that is added equal true, and I'm very happy about that, but look what I did here. I actually did a mistake. If is added equal true, and I put minus, right? And this is only a simple demo to show what we can do, right? But what if I don't need to kind of like change it and then push it again? What if I can just leverage the fact that I can change this value and see if it will solve me the problem? So I will come here and I will do is added equal false. That should change that. And I will step, and you will see that the value changed to false. And then I'm just going to move next. So we'll jump here because I put a breakpoint. Do that. And basically, when I'm going to go to the ID, you'll see that now it's fixed the problem. So now I know how to fix it. I don't Fixing it, pushing it, I'm all set. Right? So that's basically a very simple example of what this squash is doing. This is the basic. And I will show you what we did with it after it. So cool. So I'm just going to close it real quick. OK. OK. So now let's go back to the presentation and understand what we just did, like what will happen behind the scene. OK. So, so basically, it's really simple, right? The architecture is really simple. There's three components. The first one is the server, the, the squash server. Basically, the only thing that it's doing is basically orchestrate the, the, the client. Um, what it's doing is getting a request from the extension or for, to an API. And basically, what it's doing is figure out based of what you got, which node you need to talk to, and then it's going and sending the request to the client. That's really simple. The Squash client is basically, and this is a server running on Kubernetes, so basically we have a YAML, you're just installing it, it's really simple, it's like you can, you know, flex it up and down and so on. Um, then there is the Squash client. So what is the Squash client? So basically, it's a, we use it as a daemon set to make sure that it's always up. Uh, and basically, it's a Docker container wrap, basically the debugger. So I will, I, will, I will drill in a little bit more, so that's why I'm going fast to kind of like get you the full overview. And then the last thing is that the UI is basically the ID, right? We didn't want to invent the wheel. We just used the regular ID uh, of Visual Studio Code in that example. So, so again, what's happening in the flow in terms of technically? When the extension is, when, when, you know, when you're actually calling the command of the extension, what happens? It's going to, to group CTL and basically represent the user the pod. When it chooses the pod, it represents the, 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 the container. And then it, it basically represents the debugger that we support. Then it's basically sending it to the squash server. The squash server is not doing too much, but it's basically need to figure out which client to talk to, so which the container, where the, loca the container located, located in the nodes, and basically sending the request. And then basically is waiting, it, it, the, the, the ID in that case, just waiting for the debug session. It's basically waiting to tell the client of the ID debugger to where to, to, uh, to connect, right? And that's it. 
And then it's coming the request, as I said, to squash, to squash server. And what squash server is doing is basically sending it to the relevant client, and then is waiting himself, right? You need to wait for, for the debug to happen, to actually the attachment happening. And then the debug client, the only thing that it's basically doing is, so there is some trick here, and we will drill into him, because there was some challenge and that we needed to solve. Uh, but basically what you need to know is, we have some issue, and I will drill into it, but you need to kind of find, translate the, uh, the basically PID of the, uh, of the container to the PID of the host, the namespace. So, so, so I will drill into how we did it, how we find a solution, and what we did with this. And, and the, the, after we does, and it actually know what is the process that you need to attach to, what we actually doing, we just, basically there is uh, the squash client just initiate an instance of the debug uh, server and attach it to the container. And again, I will drill into it because there is some cool stuff here. And then it's returned the session on the port, basically going all the way, propagated to the IDE. Now, then it connected it and basically letting the nat native uh, debugger to work. So it's only doing the piping, it's connecting, and I said, now you, you're, you're on yourself. Do whatever, and that's why we leverage, we're not writing our own debugger, we're leveraging all the debuggers that exist. Um, so one second, but here, as I said, we're doing some tricks. So I want to kind of like focus on this, and because we are, A, we want to get a feedback, and B, it's kind of like an interesting. So what do we need to do? So this is how it's actually the Outlook, right? You have the squash client, you have Cree, and you have container that run. The container uh, PID is usually in a different namespace, and we need to kind of translate it to the host namespace uh, in order to attach it. So the way we did, and, and one of the things that was important to us the most is that we don't want to do it only for Docker container, because that's kind of easy. They kind of like returning us, but we want to be working with any uh, container runtime interface implementation that exists. So here is how we did it. I don't know if you're going to like it, I mean, we'd love to get your feedback on it, but basically what we did is this. Basically, Squash Kang is going to Cree. And when it's going to this, it's basically running an exact sync request. And what it's saying is ls, right, proc self, which is basically me, namespace. Show me all the namespace that I'm running, which is basically the ls command. And now you're getting this list of the namespace, and you basically can see that I don't know if you are familiar with the operating system, but basically there is the unique identity in the operating system is basically what's called inode. So what we're getting here is basically a unique, this is the inode, so we get an, a, a, a unique a, a inode basically of the namespace. So now we kind of like the PID namespace, so we kind of like know who it is. Once we're getting that, we basically, and now we're not using the PID actually, because the PID could actually also be on the host level, so we're actually using specifically the, the mount namespace, but this is detail, it doesn't matter. We just needed to find something that identified uh, specifically, and then we, can be, we return it to the, to the squash client, and then the squash client, who is running on the host, basically looking for this inode on the list, so you can see the code, it's really, really simple, but basically what it's doing is basically go over all the props that's running, finding the inode, finding the relevant inode, returning the PID, and now basically we have the PID of the host, so we can just go and attach that. Um, so, so that's that. There is one limitation that we have right now with this solution, which the thing is that if your container is not running LS, we kind of like have an issue, right? Uh, but, but we still kind of like, there is a way to even tweak that. You can actually inject LS and so, but we, we, we need to think about that. So we will love your feedback. Um, so okay, and, and the, the last thing is that basically the squash client, the way it's actually working is, this is a Docker file of how we're actually building it. And what you can see is that um, basically we install the GDB and the DLB in that case, and basically what we're doing after it, we just initiate, in, 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 instantiate the, the, the server itself and, and attach it. So that's really, really simple. Uh, and the beauty of what it's giving you is that what I show you in the application, you had two microservices that are reading in Go, but actually what you can do is actually have a microservice reading in Go, for instance, and another one reading in a, in a, in a in Java, and you can just attach this debug, the Java debugger to here and, uh, and the squash debugger to the other one, the, the Go debugger to the other one, and actually debug that, right, with the cross cloud. And that was kind of like um, what, you know, in the end of the day, in the beginning, we did it, not a lot of people, so we needed to choose to kind of like create an MVP before the community actually telling us if they like it or not. So what we did, we basically, it was really, really hard, right? The MVP is minimum viable to, uh, product. So we chose um, Kubernetes as a platform, because it's no-brainer. 
Uh, we choose the ID of the Visual Studio Code only because we are reading it, and that's what we like, and we choose the debugger that we're kind of using it right now, GDB and DLV. Um, but what we discovered when we open source is that actually the community really like it. And what they did is basically they, added, they asked us to add support for Marathon, so a guy from Verizon want to take the heat on doing that, and they want to add support for Swarm, and actually they also want a more debugger, like for instance, say, a Python, if they're running in production, and, and, and also more ID, like uh, IntelliJ, for instance, was a lot of the requests. So the vision is kind of like doing it that way, right? I mean, we want that to be kind of like the debugger for everything, and it should be whatever using it. And in order to do that, we created in, from the beginning the platform, the, the interface very, very clean. So in order to add, for instance, a platform for any, a, the platform, the only thing you really need to do, basically in this interface, there is everything that is a platform specific. So one thing that you need to do is, and we talked about it, to create to the container locator. You need to kind of like getting the request and you need to understand where the, the container is actually located. That would be a specific Kubernetes uh, call, right? And then in the client, the same thing, we need to translate the get PID. We talked about it. So again, we're using the Cree. Cree not exists in every platform. Actually, Kubernetes is almost the only platform that I know, at least, that you can run an exec on the container itself. So that's not the trick that we did right now will not work for something like Marathon. And the last thing is that we wanted to save the states if something happened to the square server in the middle. So what we did, we created an interface for that because in Kubernetes, we want to leverage something like third party and so on, and we, we cannot add it in the, in the rest. Um, so basically, right now it's in memory, this interface, but you can implement it now. And the debugger, it's exactly the same thing. The, what the debugger is doing is attach, detach, and port, right? Really simple. So to add the, the, the new debugger, it's really, really ridiculous. Um, and the idea, so we did it for Visual Studio Code, but we can do it for the rest. It's doable. And in the end of the day, it's an open source project that we wanted to contribute. But the question is, how kind of, what kind of speaker will be if we will be in KubeCon and I'm going to talk about service mesh? I think that will be the only session that we're not attending. So let's talk about service mesh one sec. So service mesh, for my opinion, is great because it's giving us the visibility that we talked about. We're basically now on the network. And I'm not going to tell you about what it is. So I'm going to, you know, you know what is service mesh because you heard so much about it in the last two days and you know that the DAP plane is Envoy could be Envoy, and you know that the control panel can be STL, so that's not what's interesting. But what's interesting is how you can take open tracing, squash, and service mesh, and kind of like create one, one solution that will fit, or will close all the gap. So what we did here, it's really, really simple. We basically create, a, you can make an, a, basically you can debug a service, and this is the beauty of it, a service and not a container on the infrastructure. So you're going to the, to the ID, you basically now will tell me which service you want, you would tell me um, which image in the service you want to debug, and that's it. And when we wrote, we wrote basically an Envoy plugin. So what does it mean an Envoy plugin? I don't know if you know, but you can extend that easily and basically get uh, the ability that every time, like we extend Envoy with plugin, and basically I will show the plugin in a second, but what we're doing is that way, if a request coming with the head of Squash, what the Envoy is doing, he basically going to Squash and say, debug me. And then Squash got the request from the IDE. It kind of like match it to here. It's doing all the magic, and it's attached it to the debug. And the beauty of it is, again, is for my opinion, the strongest thing, and this is basically saying the same thing. Uh, so this is the Envoy plugin. It's open source. You can go and look at it. But basically what it's doing, it's really simple. It's using the environment variable to take the pod name space and the, uh, the, 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 and the pod name, and basically creating a request to, to Squash, and then it's basically waiting for the response. Um, and the beauty, again, for my opinion, what's stronger here is that now you can actually debug it in production without posing the cluster. We're not basically stopping the cluster because the cluster will continue running with all the other requests. Only the request that you ask is going to be basically going to be stopped. Um, so that's that. I mean, there is a limitation right now to, to, uh, P, uh, to pilot and to Envoy. It's basically the fact that Envoy plugin, if you're adding a new plugin, you need to recompile it, which basically now become a new Envoy. And, 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 and the other thing with Pilot is that you need to basically configure Pilot to use the plugin. And right now, the way they did it is uh, basically outcoded configuration. So we, we're just going to fix that. And I'm talking to the community. And what we can do is basically just go to a point that just basically make this uh, plug, you know, basically make it configurable and that you will not need to do that. So we will work on it and we will try to contribute it and hopefully put it upstream. 
I mean, I will show you a demo, but again, it's really even smaller demo, uh, how it's going to work. So now basically, it's like it's spinning. So what I did right now is I basically loan the application that Ben and Lightspeed is doing with the donut salon. Um, and basically, what you can see is the code here. In a second, you will see it open, and it's already in service mesh, so it's kind of like connect. You will, you will see it connected also to Jagger. So this is the application itself, and when we will start refresh that, we will see that Jagger is connected to it as well as an open tracing. And now we will see that you know it's really simple. We basically ask a request, and and we're getting a donut. But what I want to show you is that what you can do right now is basically go into the Visual Studio and ask to debug a container in a mesh. And when you're doing this, now we will give you all the services that are running. And we will go and choose the donut salon, and it's giving you the image running on the service because we want to know which one, and we will go with the donut salon and not the proxy one. And, and that's what will happen. You will see here a little watch with basically saying, I'm waiting. And what is waiting is waiting for the call with the header to Envoy to tell you to actually debug it. So let's go and do it. Again, it's really simple. There is a curl command here. And the only thing that I did is exactly the same curl command. And the only thing you see is basically I had an header squash debug. Actually, right now, it even doesn't need the solo. Um, and then when we're clicking it, what you will see is that that, that debug attach, but now you can actually debug it. So basically, and the beauty of what we're leveraging in the Envoy is the fact that on the beginning when we did it, we said, well, but that's not, this will never work in production when we only basically attaching to the container because then you're stopping it and it just doesn't make any sense. So what we try to do, we try to do kind of like a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, we basically watch all the services, attach them all to the client, and when there is a panic, we return it. That was kind of like a hack. Then we try to do a lot of other stuff. Like for instance, you want to make sure that you, that the, that the debugger attached and, and you'll be able to kind of like debug it from the first line. So we basically put our own service and then did exact and change it to the regular one after it attached. So there was a lot of magic here that's been done. But with service mesh, we don't need to do that. It's really clear because service mesh is stopping the request until you see that the debugger attached and then it's connected and everything is good. So, so that's that. And, and, and this is okay, but I think that we can do it even better. So, Yeah, so we can do it even better, from my opinion. So, um, so, so for instance, one thing that we know is that um, the service man, Envoy basically has the ability to retry if we need, which means that he actually has the request. So what we can do if we're getting a response for 500, for instance, which is an internal server, what we can do is actually send the same request again, but now with the data of squash and kind of like debug it, so that's kind of like more automatically. Uh, we should integrate it better with the GitHub in that way because what we want is basically that it will open for the user itself. But for that, we need to find basically the commit ID. So there is an idea to do that maybe with attribute in, in Kubernetes. Uh, maybe web browser ID can, can help you because then you basically not need to run anything on your machine because it's just going to spin up everything for you. We need to integrate it better with open tracing. For, for instance, the way I envision that is service mesh and open tracing giving you the latency between the services, but now you need to zoom in and see why it's actually happening there. So you see a latency between two services, and what I would like you to be able is kind of like to zoom on top of it, on them and figure out what's happening there. Um, and that's what we have. That's what I have. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Any question? Yes. No, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Is that it? Yeah. So I can't hear you. I don't really hear you. Maybe you should. I'm sorry. Maybe you want this or something? Or come closer? Yeah. I think now I will hear you. Because you're closer. Yeah. Okay, no, no, no. Yeah. So because of the like server model, Yeah. 
It's only on, it's it's daemon set on the node. Yeah. So you do. Ah. Yeah. So basically, we don't need to, you understand. So the question was if because we have the client and the server, we don't need to have it in any, every container. And yes or not, we basically do, we did some magic there with the namespace. So we only need it as a daemon set on the node itself. That's the one instance of it, and that's it. <coughs> So, like, what I have here in the ID is something that I took from the Git up and running, but I'm actually debugging it on AWS. So the cluster itself and the container running on AWS right now on Kubernetes in AWS. Okay, so you're running on top of that. Yes, 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 yes. So basically, I'm debugging it live. It's a running cluster. Yes. So that's why I said we're using a daemon set. It's basically a YAML that we're giving you. And we use it basically, I mean, I can show it's really simple. We can, it's basically two YAML that install. One is the, the, squash, the squash server itself as a service, and then you're basically getting a YAML and it's giving you, it's putting you um, the daemon set. How would you get the body of the body? So I'm basically just using the kubectl. That way I'm leveraging their security. I'm going out and telling me, give me all the, the pod that I can see, that I'm allowed to see, right, because I'm kube. CTL, and then it's bringing it me back. So I'm just leveraging the Cook CTL. And you can see the extension is open source as well. So you basically can just go and look at it, but it's like, so dead simple. Yeah. I'll say using the iNode was a very, very clever idea. Did you use the what? iNode to be like a link between the, yeah. uh, what's called the uh, host and the container is a very clever idea. The one, uh, my question is, um, so how do you find the, um, what's called library Yes. So how do you figure that out? So it's... So I mean, how do I connect, if I understand correctly your question, you ask, how do I connect my code in the computer to the... I don't know. Yeah, okay. I, I don't understand why, yeah. Okay, any other? Okay. Awesome, so I mean, I would love if you would help us make it better, and we're trying to, like, I mean, we're already talking to Envoy and Etsy to kind of like try to integrate that, so hopefully you will use it. Thank you.